Today I spoke to Alex Howlett, a self-made economic theorist and UBI advocate out of Boston, Massachusetts. He runs, to my estimation, one of the most interesting blogs about universal basic income on his website, Gresham.org. I first met Alex at a Basic Income New York conference. He immediately struck me as someone in possession of a very coherent and rigorous model of society and the economy, which he had clearly built himself after much thought and effort. It's always a good sign in my book. He's attempted to strip down the discussion to its essentials, and in so doing has produced an interesting and powerful vision of the core purpose of UBI, which necessarily suggests a future direction of UBI policy. If you're just getting introduced to the concept of basic income through the Andrew Yang phenomenon, you'll notice there are a few small but powerful differences between Alex's view and the current popular narrative. I do hope that doesn't put you off, because ultimately, I do think the two narratives play nice together. How I would put it is, Personally, I'm very short on the current economic paradigm, I'm long on Andrew Yang's vision, and I'm even longer on Alex's vision of the future of our economy. Okay, well, um, thanks Alex, thanks for doing this. Uh, it's nice to have you here in New York City from Boston, right? Yep. Okay, cool. First, just like set the scene for me. How did you first get involved in the universal basic income scene? Ooh, that's a good question. So my story is a little bit unconventional. Um, my background is in software development, and software developers hate copyrights and patents because it gets in the way of our work. Um, so I was thinking one day, I was imagining as a thought experiment, what would happen if we eliminated all copyrights and patents? What would happen to the economy? Uh, and it occurred to me that the economy would still be capable of producing everything it was producing before, um, but there would be a lot of people who didn't have the jobs that they had before. They would lose their income. Uh, so, you know, I was thinking about this and I was like, well, there has to be a way to provide income to people because we know the economy is capable of producing things for, for them to buy. Uh, so that's when I kind of thought of the idea of, of basic income or when I, when I discovered it. And, you know, there's this whole online community, even back then in 2011, um, that, was, that was discussing this. So I got really excited that people were talking about it, um, but I certainly came at it from a different angle from other people. Interesting. So if I hear, understand you right, like you kind of came to the idea or the need for the idea first, and then you happened to find, oh, there's other people talking about this problem, this solution. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and, you know, I was thinking, well, we're always eliminating jobs. You know, why haven't we needed, uh, why, how have we even been surviving without a basic income before, before today? Um, so I started thinking about that, and then I started thinking about uh, the labor market and whether we're using jobs as a way to give people money instead of because there's work that needs doing and all that kind of stuff. So it just kind of, uh, that was the beginning of it for me. I would say that because I came at it from a different angle, I think about basic income a little bit differently than a lot of people too. Um, so most people, when they talk about basic income, they're thinking about um, some uh, level of subsistence that we need to support in our economy. Um, so people need a certain quality of life. So let's calculate what that is and then provide people with that amount of money. Uh, but from, from my perspective, my question is, why don't we just, um, why would we ever want the amount of the basic income to be anything less than the full amount that the economy can sustain? Um, it doesn't make sense to me. So instead of uh, the kind of subsistence basic income that you hear more typically talked about, I advocate a calibrated basic income where we, use an, where we algorithmically kind of uh, increase the amount of basic income until we reach the limits of what the economy can handle. And that way we kind of maximize uh, human prosperity or what, what we can get out of the economy. Gotcha. Before we go any further, uh, yeah. what is your, your definition of universal basic income? What's the simplest way of explaining it to someone who's never heard of the concept before? It's an unconditional income paid out to every individual person. And what makes it basic? The income itself is basic. It's basic because everybody gets it. So a lot of people think that, you know, because it has the word basic in it, it's only for people's basic needs or something like that. I would say that uh, the income is basic in the sense that everyone gets it and it forms a base uh, on top of which you can participate in the economy in other ways. What do you say to people who say that it's going to cause runaway inflation? Yeah, um, so this is why, this is a big part of why I talk about a calibrated basic income. Because if you keep consumer spending in line with what the economy is actually producing, then there is no inflation. There can't be. It's impossible. Um, so, so, you know, some people might think that the amount of basic income 
that the economy could s sustain is very tiny. Uh, and I don't, think, I don't think that's the case. But if you believe that, then the way you can prove it to me is by implementing a calibrated basic income and see where it calibrates at. Uh, and then you're fine. So the question isn't uh, whether the economy can handle a basic income. The question is how much basic income can an economy handle without running into problems like inflation. So calibration is the answer to inflation, basically. Calibration, yeah. Um, are there, I, we've all heard about Alaska. Are there any other uh, examples around the world where people have tried something similar to this? Yeah. Um, I would say not at any large scale. And Alaska is, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite meager compared borderline. To the yeah. And it's a, it's a varying amount uh, each year, depending on like oil. There are various experiments uh, going on to kind of test some of the aspects of basic income. Um, in different places. I think the one that's closest to a basic income is probably um, the trial that's being done by GiveDirectly in Africa. And they, they've picked a village and they're uh, giving an unconditional income to basically everyone in the village. Um, and that's kind of close. But I, I would say that the, these are mostly testing uh, the effects of direct cash transfers. Basic income isn't just a direct cash transfer. It's, it's something that's going to everyone, and it's affecting the overall economy. So the effects of basic income are macroeconomic. You can't really test it without implementing it at a large scale. Because the question is, like, the question is right. The questions are about inflation. The questions are about, you know, what can the economy handle? If you're just giving one person some money, then the economy is staying the same, and you're just improving that, that person's situation. You're not learning much interesting by way of whether basic income is, is something that, that works for the economy. So you really have to, have to kind of think about it from a macro level, and you can't really test that. Gotcha. Yeah. So, we, OK, we talked about the basicness of basic yeah. income. What about the universal side of it? Uh, why, would, why should everyone get it? Why should rich people uh, have this right. money as well? Yeah, so this is a question that comes up a lot. Um, and I would say that if you want rich people not to get the money, we can do that. Um, but the most efficient way to do that is on the taxation side. So if you give everyone the same amount of money, then nobody can fall through the cracks. It's not like you fail to give the money to, uh, to someone who, who needed it or something like that. Um, but if you want the, money, the distribution of the income to be you know, not going to rich people as much, what you can do is on the taxation side, you can, you can say, OK, um, we want to take money away from you. And now if the government fails to you know, adequately determine who deserves what, they're only failing to tax someone. That's not nearly as harmful as failing to uh, support someone who needed the money. So there is, um, you know, we could have a debate about whether rich people should get the money or not in general. Um, but even if you're of the camp that we need to be taking money away from rich people or giving rich people less money, it's much more efficient to do that on the taxation side. And it aligns the incentives of the government uh, with, with getting it right. Because if the government doesn't tax, you know, they get less revenue. Whereas if the government fails to pay out um, you know, some direct cash payment to you know, say 20% of the people who qualify for it, now they've saved money. So the incentives are backwards there. Gotcha. As, lo as long as the taxes are correctly in place, um, is it accurate to say that, I mean, they're not technically, they're, they're getting the money only in some nominal sense. They're not really receiving it because they're paying out into the system more than they're receiving from it. Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and there are other people who talk about, you know, we want people to feel like it's a right of citizenship. They're, so, you know, like everyone gets it. There's not as much stigma and that kind of stuff. I think all of that stuff is true. But the main thing is this thing. If you're giving it to everyone, you're not going to fail to, to let anyone fall through the cracks. Or you're not going to let anyone fall through the cracks. Yeah. Now, another common challenge is, won't people stop working? Uh, is it gonna, this, isn't this going to make people lazy if you just give people money yeah. unconditionally? Um, and a lot of basic income proponents, they respond by saying, no, 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 we, we wouldn't make it enough money so that people would stop working or something like that. I would question whether that's a reasonable goal. And I would argue that if your basic income isn't causing some people to stop working, then it's not high enough. The basic income is not high enough. Um, because the truth is there's... Um, you know, we're often worried about uh, whether people are contributing to society. But what we're not worried about, which is what I think we should be worried about, is 
uh, what is the right level of labor that's necessary for the amount of output we have in the economy? So it's possible to under-incentivize work and then not enough people are working and we have problems with that. But then it's po possible to over-incentivize work too. And now you have people working, but it's not actually adding to the economy's production. You have people working as an excuse to give them money. Uh, so, so, the quest, so when we calibrate the basic income to the economy's productive capacity, that means we're, we're getting the labor market such that it's efficient and that the only work that's being done is actually work that needs doing. I agree completely. Um, the, I can't help but notice there's a lot of other problems, political problems people get upset about today, yeah. such as uh, the climate crisis, pollution, sure. and uh, undue corporate influence over people's lives. And those, in, in many ways, can be stemmed to a problem of overproduction. Okay, uh, how do we pay for UBI? Yeah, so everybody asks how to pay for it. Um, and the thing to remember is that the economy can s sustain a UBI if there's somewhere for the money to go. Uh, so as long as consumers have something to buy with the money, this comes back to kind of our inflation question. As long as some consumers have something to buy with the money, then we can give them the money. And there won't be inflation and the economy can sustain the spending. So, you know, am I saying that, you know, we can just print money and hand it out to people? I am kind of saying that because as long as the consumer spending is matched up with the level of production, we're fine. So I like to tell people that a properly implemented basic income has no tax associated with it. So people are always worried about where the government has to get money from, but the government doesn't have to get money from anywhere. What matters is that, um, is that there's room in the economy for the government to spend. And this isn't just about basic income, it's about any government spending. Uh, so I think in order to understand basic income properly, in order to understand how, um, in order to understand how, how to possibly make it work, um, you have to kind of change your thinking about what makes it possible for the government to spend. And I would add to that, that, you know, basic income is not, you know, we should be thinking about the costs of the status quo. So we're worried about the, the price of basic income, but really we're, we're paying a high price with, with poverty and inefficiency. Um, you know, if we have, if we're, if we're making up jobs as an excuse to pay people, you, you know, using our economic policy, then that's incredibly wasteful of resources, including people's time, and it's bad for the environment with all those people, you know, kind of commuting uh, needlessly. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think having a basic income is cheaper than not having a basic income. And that's even if you don't have any taxes associated with it. Um, this idea of there being having to be room in the economy for the government to spend into yeah. um, is this is this is there a particular theory associated with this? Is this some a worldview of your own invention? Um, uh, I mean, I certainly I certainly think about it in that way. Um, I can tell you what it's not. A lot of people think that there's a certain amount of money in the economy, and that if you increase the amount of money. Uh, the prices just have to go up. Like they have to, because now there's more money circulating. And I would say that money doesn't, doesn't really circulate. It flows through the economy. Uh, so what matters isn't kind of, what matters for inflation isn't kind of how much money is, exists in the economy, but what matters is the rate at which money is flowing through the economy. So that's the rate of consumer spending. So we can do things like uh, create jobs or, or, or create a story about taxes, about how existing money is being redistributed back to consumers and that kind of thing. But really it doesn't matter, for, the, for prices, it doesn't really matter where they're getting their money from. What matters is that the, the amount of spending is at the right level. Um, now in terms of other, other theories and schools of thought, um, quantity theory of money is pretty pervasive in economics. Um, I know that the, the modern monetary theorists talk about uh, balancing the economy rather than balancing the budget. Um, so they talk about, you know, I mean, all macroeconomists talk about productive capacity and all of that. Um, but, you know, they, the MMT people um, talk about not worrying too much about um, uh, the amount of taxes with respect to, you know, the amount of government spending and just, just getting the economy balanced. Uh, and I certainly think that's the right perspective to take. I don't agree with them on everything, but I agree with them on that. I don't know that they emphasize um, what I emphasize in terms of the, the flow of money being more important than kind of the amount of money out there. Yeah. Right, what other major issues do you have with um, proponents of modern monetary theory? Yeah, so there's a few. So um, one of the things that, or kind of their main focus is they're kind of like, uh, 
guiding, you know, their goal is to address the problem of, uh, of underemployment. So they want to use fiscal policy to, to kind of get the economy to full employment. I would say that underemployment is not the problem. I would say that the problem is underconsumption or, or um, uh, people having a lack of access to the resources that the economy can produce for them or the goods and services that the economy can produce for them. So rather than trying to get everyone working, um, which is what MMT says, I want to um, get everyone uh, access, uh, get everyone the means of consumption by giving them money so they can, they can activate the economy's full productive capacity. It's about um, getting the economy to full production rather than getting the economy to full employment. And I wouldn't know that, I, I would say that MMT proponents often don't distinguish between these two things. They kind of assume that, that jobs are productive or they assume that if we create jobs then we can do it in productive ways and that kind of thing. Um, so that's a big thing. Another thing is kind of how they think about money. Um, they very much emphasize the role of taxes in giving money value. Um, so they kind of have this story about um, how you know, the money that the government issues is worthless and it has value, um, it gains its value because you have to pay taxes using it. And I think there's some truth to that, but, but it's, it's somewhat narrow and more broadly we can say that money has value because it allows you to buy things in general, not just taxes. Taxes are one of the things. And if you have an economy that's, uh, that's you know, uh, at scale and operating and, and you know, people are buying and selling a lot of different things, you actually don't need taxes at all. To, to maintain a, a currency. Like I would argue, um, and this would be controversial with MMT people, that the United States government could stop taxing entirely and the US dollar would be fine. Because what matters is, um, is that people trust that they can buy uh, the things they need. And taxes might be one of the things they need to, to do with money, but it's not the only one. Uh, and we have ways through monetary policy of, of managing the flow of money through the economy. Yeah. In that worldview, is, is it correct to say that um, that the deficit spending is more like a, a ledger of government investment and, and that's the primary funding mechanism and then taxes are purely punitative or they, they kind of shape the market? Yeah, I would say that the, for me, the main use of taxes would be to change incentives, change people's incentives in the economy. So if someone is wasting a lot of resources, like actual resources that are scarce, you can tax that activity and it would free up those resources for, for consumers. Um, so in that sense, you could use taxes to, uh, to, to boost output, to allow us to have a higher basic income so people can buy more stuff, that kind of thing. Uh, but it's not about the money, it's about the resources. Uh, you could also use taxes uh, in such a, so to kind of illustrate this, you could, you could have a tax on something very efficient. Um, and now you're taxing the efficient activity and that reduces the amount of resources that are available uh, to the economy. So um, you could have a tax on, I don't know what a good example of something efficient is, but you could have a tax on, 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 on something and force people to do it in a less, less efficient way and then that would actually lower the basic income you could afford. Would an example be like, um, like a carbon tax? Because that's not, it's not about giving the revenue, it's about changing the behavior of the market away from an undesirable yeah. outcome. Right, a carbon tax is a great example and it's also a good example of where um, the desired outcome is not necessarily to maximize economic output right now. So the carbon tax might make certain forms of production less efficient in terms of what the economy can provide people right now, but it helps conserve this resource, which is uh, important to conserve for the future. And we can think of the, the room in the atmosphere to absorb more carbon as, as a resource that we want to conserve. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay, so one other common concern that comes up, of course, rent, landlords, yeah. aren't they gonna just raise the rent on people if we give people a bunch of basic income? Won't your rent be up uh, that by that amount the next month? Yeah, that's a question that comes up a lot. Uh, and, and I would say no, uh, that actually the opposite is gonna happen. So when you think about uh, why rents are so high, a big part of that is because the uh, housing market is very much intertwined with the labor market. 
So people are getting their incomes from the labor market. So they're kind of tied to locations. Uh, and that can help drive up housing prices. But if you give people a basic income, that's an income that's not tied to any particular location. So it gives people the freedom to live in a lot more different places. It gives them more flexibility to choose where to live. So this takes a lot of the power away from, from landlords in terms of raising rents. Like landlords, of course, they always want to charge as much rent as possible, right? If you give the tenants a, a, you know, a thousand more dollars, they want to charge a thousand more dollars. But they can't charge more than the tenants are willing to pay. So basic income really helps from the tenant side by giving them options. Um, another way of thinking about it is that it's almost like you're flooding the market with more, more housing for people because now people can live in more different places. Um, and a big part, uh, another thing is that a big part of what makes housing so expensive is speculation. So people treat um, homes as investments. Uh, and then that, can, that, can, that kind of has a positive feedback loop that drives up housing prices even further. Um, so something like a basic income can interrupt that feedback loop and cause the housing prices to come back down potentially. What, what do you think are the advantages and the disadvantages of the automation narrative as a justification for UBI? Well, I like that you put it that way because it really is a double-edged sword. So I think automation is calling attention to the fact that jobs have always been the wrong way to provide consumers with income. Uh, you know, in an efficient labor market, we would want the only purpose of wages to be to incentivize work that actually needs doing. Um, so certainly it's a very um, powerful image if, if, if people think, you know, this AI wave is coming and, and they're like, oh my God, what are we going to do? That's going to wake people up and that's great. Um, so that's the positive side of the automation narrative. The negative side of the automation narrative is that this is not a new problem and the way we've responded to technological advancement, labor saving, technology in the past is that we've created unnecessary work for people to do as an excuse to pay them. So there's no reason why we can't stop doing, or there's no reason why we can't keep doing that. So, you know, you might may have heard of the idea of a federal jobs guarantee, for example. So this, this is, if you have something like that, if you continue to use make work to push, to push money to consumers, the robots are never going to take the jobs. You know, we can keep going like this. So the automation narrative is great because it kind of gets people's attention, but it's not so great when you realize that it's not actually happening, that because we can keep doing this. We've gotten very, very good at creating jobs for people, uh, and that's a problem. The robots aren't coming, and that's a problem, and, we, and basic income can help us do something about that. With basic income, we don't have to feel guilty anymore about eliminating the jobs that we don't want to be doing anyway. I, I'm, I'm totally on board with this. Okay, so <laughs> what do you think of the Andrew Yang campaign in general? I mean, the automation narrative is, is pretty crucial, you know, crucial right. part of that. Yeah. And do you, do you, are, do you concerned that, are you concerned that there's kind of structural weaknesses getting built into the argument from that side, if that's what's getting the popularity around it? I do think there are weaknesses being built in, but it might be the case that that narrative was necessary to get people on board. Um, I think the, uh, the Andrew Yang campaign is really exciting. It's bringing the discussion of basic income kind of to the forefront. You know, I, I meet people these days and they actually know what I'm talking about. And they're like, have you ever heard of basic income or universal basic income, right? So I think that's great. Um, I also think it's a stepping stone, right? So Andrew Yang can come in and say, robots are taking all the jobs and get everyone to pay attention. And then I can come in and say, no, actually the robots are not going to take over, and that's a problem. We need to, we need to you know, give people the freedom to spend their time how they choose to the extent that that's possible. So I think it's, it's, it's a process of kind of like getting people to start to think about this stuff. And, and I think the Andrew Yang campaign is great, and I really support, um, support it, yeah. If it's true that tying income to jobs was never a reasonable assumption to yeah. begin with, um, why has this stayed stubbornly in place for so long? I mean, that would suggest quite a long period yeah. of people being attached to this idea? So that's a really great question. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to give like the definitive answer on this. Um, but certainly it's the case that um, in order to get anything done in a small scale society, you need social incentives to cooperate. So you need, you know, we need to have this morality of judging people for not contributing and that kind of thing. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And in a large scale society, the market solves that problem for us. We pay people uh, at, to provide the incentive for them to do the work. Um, so those social incentives are not really necessary anymore if we just tweak the monetary incentive to the right level. Um, 
I think that's, that's kind of like the simplest thing, but in terms of why it hasn't shifted, um, you know, it could, it could be like path dependence, like we just are used to thinking this way. And, you know, when the industrial revolution happened, uh, you know, Karl Marx looked at what was happening and then instead of saying, oh, wait, maybe labor isn't the right way to get people incomes, he kind of doubled down on labor and said, like, labor is creating all the value in the economy uh, and the fact that people aren't being rewarded for it means they're being exploited, that kind of thing. And it goes back to Adam Smith, too, like the first line in Wealth of Nations, I, I can't quote it verbatim, but it's something like uh, the product of the economy comes from the labor of the workers. That's how he opens Wealth of Nations. So it kind of gets uh, codified, um, you know, again and again uh, throughout history. And then, you know, the Great Depression, John Maynard Keynes, um, he wasn't trying to solve the problem of people not having enough money. He was trying to solve the problem of underemployment, right? So it kind of keeps perpetuating itself. Um, I don't know. Hopefully we can change that. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I like what you said there. Um, because we're trying to, it, it, it has been recodified multiple times. So yeah. it gets codified by the right when they're kind of uh, doubling down on capitalism and the free market. It gets yeah. codified on the left in that kind of emphasis on labor in left politics yes. and leftist theory. And I, yeah, it, we're not attacking the kind of, the kind yes. of root assumption there that's allowing all of the, this excess to occur. This is something that the right and the left agree on and they're wrong about. Um, and you, know, you can have like two sides of this coin, like people on the right might say, get a job, and then people on the left might say, um, you know, people are suffering and these are the workers who you know, the rich people are getting rich on the backs of and that kind of thing. But both sides are emphasizing that the labor is what's important and what gives people value is kind of their contribution, the work that they're doing. I think it's, it's much more useful to think of people as inherently valuable. And then the work and the labor, it's only there to serve the people, not the other way around. People are people first. They're there, you know, in terms of their role in their economy, their role is to consume that benefit. The economy exists for that benefit. And the workers and the producers exist to, conserve, uh, to serve the consumers. Mm. Yeah. You talk about past dependence. You said that the market solves the social problem for us. And that matches up with my view. In a way, I kind of, these normative claims, right, where the right is going to say work hard, and the left is going to say work hard, that's not going anywhere. Right. And I, the way I see this is kind of like, it's, I think, our obligation to return that to being a social problem, make it an interpersonal problem that people have to deal with. What are you doing with your life? What do you want to do? What should yeah. we be doing? As opposed to the market forces making those determinations for yeah. us and pushing and pulling us wherever the market wants to go. Right, and I mean, to some extent, the market, for, the market forces have to do what they do. But w the mistake that we're making is that we are forcing the market to do more than it needs to do. So we're forcing the market to uh, to get people to work even when we don't necessarily need that work. So to the extent that we have the freedom to, to let people do what they want, uh, basic income can, can give us that opportunity. Um, I think, you know, people, when we talk about eliminating jobs and what if people aren't working, um, a lot of people worry, well, how are they going to get meaning and purpose in their lives? And I think that's kind of, kind of what you're getting at. Uh, and basic income, of course, doesn't answer that question. It doesn't solve that problem. It just gives people money, which of course is a really important thing too. But another thing that doesn't solve that problem is forcing people to do useless work, right? Like there's a reason why Zeus sent in Sisyphus to eternally push a boulder up a hill. It was torturing him. Um, so I would say that, that we are inadvertently torturing our people by, for by forcing them to work and by making up jobs for them to do as an excuse to pay them. Yeah, I forget what the statistics are. I think it was 60% of workers in the UK feel like their jobs are totally Meaninglessness? Yeah. yeah, I mean, if we were making up jobs to give people meaning and purpose, these are not the jobs we would be making up. Right. Yeah. UBI doesn't give you meaning, but it may free up the time so that you can now pursue meaning, yeah. whereas you could not before. Yeah, and if we actually want to think about, well, what can we do to provide people with you know, interesting activities and you know, give them purpose and that kind of thing, we can do that, but then we'll be thinking about what are we providing for the people? What kinds of of, of lives are we allowing them to live instead of like thinking them as producers because the work is not producing and it's also not providing uh, the, the benefit to the worker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, back to political considerations. Yeah. Um, I mean, because we're, we're sort of on the same page here, but we're sort of taking it for granted. This is a pretty radical uh, yeah. undoing of the standard assumptions of, of, of where revenue comes from through taxes. Right. And um, when you look at something like uh, Andrew, Yan Andrew Yang's plan yeah. to fund it through an additional VAT tax, is it possible even to kind of 
skip ahead and advocate w what's more important to get the UBI in place or to convince people that um, how, how they believe money works is wrong? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think pragmatically the most important thing to do right now is to get the UBI in place. Okay, I agree. Uh, and then once people see that, uh, that will really help them shift their thinking a little bit. Um, and in terms of being able to get it passed, um, because of the bird rule uh, in Congress, uh, that means that it's a lot easier to pass legislation that, uh, does, that, that's revenue neutral, right? So if you can make a plan revenue neutral, you only need 51% of Congress. If, you are, are, if there's some deficit, you know, more spending than taxing built into your plan, then that makes it a lot harder to get through. So you know, a question we can ask is, if you have to make your basic income revenue neutral, uh, what's the least disruptive way to do that? And I think the VAT is up there. I think, uh, I think you know, uh, in you're not targeting specific people, you know, that kind of thing. It's a tax on the overall economy. Um, I do think since it's a, a blanket tax on all production in the economy, it actually reduces the level of basic income we can afford because it, 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 it takes a little bit, the, the productive capacity of the economy takes a little bit of a hit. So it, it, it's funny because we're talking about the VAT funding the basic income, but the VAT actually, actually reduces uh, the level of basic income we can afford. But it's probably not going to reduce it below $1,000 a month. Uh, and it's not really going to hurt consumers either. So, I mean, I think, I think a VAT, you know, if I were designing it, I might design it with a VAT. I might do some other things uh, as well, like we talked a little bit before about um, what kind of taxes are useful in an economy if we're not worried about tax revenue. Um, so those taxes would be like to change incentives. A big one that a lot of people talk about is the land value tax. Uh, if you tax the, the kind of, un, like this is the Henry George stuff, like if you tax the, the unimproved uh, value of the land, that creates an incentive for people to develop. It creates an incentive for people to use the land in productive ways. Um, so this kind of tax is probably a tax we would want anyway, or it could be a tax we would want anyway. Um, so if you're trying to balance the, the, the basic income, if you're trying to make it revenue neutral, then we could, we could start to add some of these taxes that we want anyway, and then use some of the revenue from that to go towards, towards, the, towards balancing it out, yeah. Any quick tips on talking about universal basic income to people, trying to convince other people who, or to see the value of this proposal, what's like the top two recommendations oh, you have? So it's so different uh, for everyone I talk to because different people are worried about different things, right? Um, but I, I mean, a big part, uh, one of the big ones is why should people get money they didn't earn or don't deserve or that kind of thing. Um, so rather than kind of uh, pushing back on the idea that some people deserve money and some people don't, which I'm not sure is a healthy way to think about it, um, I would ask them, I would say, you know, like, we are, the government is using economic policy to create jobs for people. They, they're, they already are handing out the money. And if you have a job, some, some portion of the money you're getting is a government handout. The government is handing out money, but they're hiding it behind the fact that they're handing out jobs. And it's really something that needs to happen. Like, uh, the economy is not going to work if consumers don't have spending money. So if the government wants to hand out money, uh, and because of our social hang-ups, they have to be really inefficient and force people to do useless work, that is, you know, that is a problem. So if you, if you, if you point out to people that they didn't necessarily earn the money that they get anyway, that the government decided that they wanted consumers to have more, more spending money, so they stimulated the economy and created more jobs and that kind of thing, then I think maybe that might help loosen up people's thoughts. I think the best thing to do is ask questions, questions that get people to, uh, to think about um, why work is important and, and, yeah, that kind of thing, what we're capable of. What is the primary, we've talked a lot about this assumption about people not deserving the, the yeah. money, deserving a handout, yeah. and I associate that mostly coming from the right. What are the big challenges? What's the number one challenge on, on, in the political discourse on the left in America, liberals talking to liberals on this issue that you encounter? I think the biggest challenge is, the, um, is still the, the worker centrism, like focusing on labor and the value of labor and that people, um, you know, that labor is what gives a person value. Labor is somehow noble. And I mean, the labor market is, it, it's just a market for getting people to do things they wouldn't ordinarily do. And we, we kind of, 
we think of workers as noble, but the work that they're doing, they're doing it because they're being paid to do it. It's not like, it's not like you know, they're doing it because they need to survive, that kind of thing. They're not like these heroes or something like that. Um, and I think uh, the challenge on the left is to get past this idea that, that workers are the important thing to care about in the economy. Yeah. What's next for you? Uh, what's on your itinerary as far as making progress with UBI? What else are you up to? Yeah, so I'm up to a lot of things. Uh, I've written a, a paper that explains uh, a lot of the underlying economics of basic income. So this is, this is related to the whole labor thing too. It's not just our social stuff. Our, our economic models kind of assume that labor is the most important resource in the economy. They assume that you know, the way consumers get their spending money is through labor. So I've written a paper that explains the economy without that assumption. Uh, so, so that's a big part of it. I want to, you know, still working on it, you know, trying to get feedback. I'm not an economist, so a lot of times people don't take me seriously, which is reasonable. It's on me to kind of, kind of demonstrate that to people. Um, so I also host uh, the Boston Basic Income Discussion Group. If you're in the Boston area ever, uh, you, you can come in person. So, so you can find the Facebook group on Facebook, and then it's live streamed on YouTube. Uh, so we've got, you know, uh, you can participate in the live stream and we respond to people's questions on there. Um, and then you can also watch the, the archived videos on there. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been really fun and it's helped me talk about basic income because I get to talk to different people, different perspectives, that kind of thing. Uh, and then the, the other thing that I'm doing, the other main thing that I'm doing is I'm developing a complementary currency system for the purpose of implementing a basic income. So I kind of, when I talk to people about, about basic income in general, I, I often stay away from that because people often associate that with cryptocurrencies and people who don't really understand economics and that kind of thing. Um, so that's actually, uh, that's actually been a little bit, a bit of a challenge for me, like balancing that side of it with the basic income side of it. But it was basic income first. Um, and I figured, when I figured out that you might be able to implement something like this through a private organization, you know, this was before Andrew Yang came along. So, you know, I was like, it's never going to happen through the government and, right. you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Right. It's kind of like a race. Who, who, who gets there first, private or public? Right, right, exactly. Both there, are you know. good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. And where can, where can people go online to follow you and keep touch with your project? Yeah, so I am at Alex Howlett UBI on Twitter, uh, and my website is www.gresham.org. So the main part of the website is about Project Gresham, this currency system that I'm working on. But then if you go to the blog, the blog is entirely about basic income in general. Um, and you know, I try to, try to describe it in ways that are digestible to, to the general public. Um, and I'm talking about basic income in a way that nobody else is really talking about it. Alex, thank you very much for sitting down with me today. This yeah. was wonderful. Thanks, Derek. And best of luck with your projects. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview. It definitely got me thinking. What it makes me think about is a world where the right could say something like, they want to pay fewer taxes, and the left could say, yes, and we shall have more social spending too. What an interesting world that would be to actually live in. The question is, how do we get there? And I think the best way is for more people to learn to think of the economy as a game. When people design games, they tend to discover certain features that tend to work. Pieces, spaces, die rolls, card stacks. Consumers, resources, money, taxes, spending, these perennial features emerge as incredibly useful. And although they retain largely the same functions, they can be arranged in a variety of different ways and serve a variety of different purposes to build different kinds of games. But some games are more fun to play than others. So we should always ask ourselves, what kind of game could we try to play that would be the most fun for the most people for the longest amount of time? I think that the game that we play today is more fun than games we used to play, but it's not as fun as it could be. And if we keep insisting on playing it the way we do today, I don't think it will last very much longer. For my Monopoly money, I think that Alex's view is the closest I've heard to a game that we could keep playing for a very, very long time. I very much agree with his view on calibrated income and on the overall purpose of the economy. If I disagree anywhere, 
it would just be to stress that I also stick up for the Andrew Yang narrative of robots taking our jobs. I, I think it's absolutely correct in the short term that automation will steal very many jobs, causing major social economic disruptions. But it is also true that one very possible solution to the situation would be to do what we've done before and make up unnecessary work. This is absolutely something we should try to avoid. And I do think in the meantime, it's possible to hold both of these views simultaneously. We need to, as it were, build a bridge between the Yang view and the Alex view. And I do think that Yang and most of his followers already understand this dynamic completely. I'm not at all worried about a clash of arguments here. At any rate, I do hope you check out Alex's blog. Many of my own ideas he seems to have arrived at before me, and many of his ideas I've since found myself incorporating into my Reddit and Discord discussions. I particularly recommend his pieces, We Are All Disabled, and Inequality Is Not The Problem. As usual, if any of this provokes interesting thoughts or strong feelings, please email me. I accept all invitations to discussion and all challenges to debate.